Uh, our guest in this segment is Joshua Higginbotham. He was at one time the youngest elected delegate in the history of the state of West Virginia. He is currently running for Ag Commissioner. Joshua has driven in this morning to be a part of the program. Let's welcome him in. Josh, good morning to you, buddy. Hey, good morning. So good to be on your show. Heard, heard it many times and get to put a face to a name. Yeah, well, it's great to have you here. Uh, did you literally drive in from Charleston for this? Uh, well, I, I had a couple of uh, business partners up here in the Panhandle that I work with. I was already in town for some meetings. Uh, I, I'm a certified firearms instructor with the U.S. Concealed Carry Association and do a lot of their administrative work, uh, business development, and uh, cover the whole state. I thought, well, while I'm in Martinsburg, I might as well stop by the station. Tell me about your uh, young life growing up and the decision to run for delegate at the age of, what, 18, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So I was actually a senior in high school when I was approached by the West Virginia Republican Party and a couple uh, local legislators about running. And uh, I was like, well, you guys know I'm in high school still. And they're like, uh, no, we didn't know that. <laughs> uh, I've been involved since 2008, uh, knocking on doors for campaigns. And uh, You can tell your guy to come in, by the way, if he wants to come in and take pictures of you. While oh, you're OK. Yeah, I, I may do that uh, on the next break. But I um, yeah, I ran 2016, uh, was elected, won by 25 votes, beat the incumbent and uh, served almost six years, about five and a half years. And now I'm running for agriculture commissioner. Grew up on a family farm down in the Kanawha Valley. We have a 900-acre cattle farm. Uh, we have about 120 longhorn cows. Uh, my first job from the time I was about 10 years old through high school was there. And uh, then in the legislature, served on the, the ALEC uh, Agriculture Task Force. Visited about 10 other states, meeting with their departments of agriculture, seeing how agriculture is done in a lot of other places. And frankly, we're doing it wrong here. That's, so, that's why you're running. That is why I'm running. All right. You mentioned yeah. something about not being able to get uh, some messages returned. Sure, sure. So our farm, uh, you know, we've we've had it for more than 20 years now. Uh, we've expanded it into other other properties in the Kanawha Valley. Um, but what we'd like to do is build some more industrial-sized agriculture distribution centers. Uh, we have some property down there in the Kanawha Valley. It would create about 50 jobs. We already put on all the infrastructure. Uh, our family has all the, the facilities there, including the rail lines put in. And uh, right now, all of the farmers from Charleston, Huntington, and Parkersburg and in between, we have to truck our corn to Columbus, Ohio, just to load it on trains uh, to bring to other parts of the country, Tyson Chicken, uh, General Mills, because there's no distribution center in the southern part of the state. None. And we have the ability to put one in. Uh, and we can't get a call back from the Department of Agriculture. Um, we, we'd like to be able to work with folks, and I'm getting complaints from farmers throughout the state, especially now that I've been running. I've been an announced candidate for about two weeks now, and uh, people are telling me in every single county that I visit, Joshua, we need somebody different in the Department of Agriculture, uh, and they're glad to see me running. So... I got in the race. And here you are today, Bill. Yeah, yeah you mentioned 120 Longhorns. Mm -hmm. I can see three or four Longhorns, kind of a novelty. What do you do with 120 Longhorns? Eat them. <laughs> Is that right? Do you, they're, they're for beef? Yeah, yeah, they're actually really good. They're really good. And they're gentle, too. They're, they're larger than like a black Angus cow, but uh, they're, uh, they're not as, as dangerous as, as you'd think. Yeah. Um, they're uh, such a beautiful animal. They really are. Depends on which end of the <laughs> horn you're on, though. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad, his, his button-up shirt actually got caught in uh, the horn of one of them, and all they yeah. did was turn their head, and it yeah. ripped every button off. <laughs> <laughs> Strong animal. Yeah. 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 Except for communication uh, and perhaps distribution yeah. centers, what would you do? different as Secretary of Agriculture. And what is the Secretary of Agriculture's job? Dude, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah. Well, well, I'll say that we've had one obviously since 1863. It's the whole state. About half of the country has gotten away from electing their Agriculture Commissioner and they've appointed it uh, like a cabinet level position for the governor. Uh, and uh, there's, there's perks of, of having it elected versus appointed. Um, really and truly, what the Department of Agriculture needs to do moving forward is getting more young people involved in agriculture. Our surrounding states, um, some of those rural communities are losing population, kind of like West Virginia is. You all don't have that much of a problem with that here in the Panhandle. Uh, but in the rest of the state, most counties have lost population. 
And so we need to incentivize people to live in rural communities again. Uh, and if you want to get people involved in agriculture, get them interested in farming, you have to make it easier for them to live in a rural community. You need roads, you need water and sewer lines, you need broadband internet for those rural communities. Uh, those were some of the focuses that I had when I was in the legislature. Uh, and that's what we need to do at the Department of Agriculture is work with the federal government and the state government, getting those infrastructure dollars put in the areas where it's needed the most. Do you see a difference? There are obvious differences, but from the agricultural aspect, a uh, significant difference between the eastern panhandle mm -hmm. and the, uh, say, the western part of the state? Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, agritourism. Is a, is a huge difference. Uh, there's not as much agritourism in the southern and western parts of the state as as here. You know, you all have a lot of uh, uh, apple orchards here, um, and uh, there's some some vineyards as well in the state. Uh, but in the Ohio Valley, uh, in the Kanawha Valley, you have large swaths of flat land. It's uh, like about half of our property is corn, soy, and wheat. Um, but uh, you know, it, you need to focus also on agritourism. On our farm, we have an event venue called the Historic Woodlawn Estate. Uh, during COVID, uh, people wanted to start renting out our farm for weddings, and we just let our friends use it, and then it turned into a business. Last year, we had over 7,000 West Virginians come to our property for weddings, parties, fundraisers, family reunions. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a local schools going to have their prom there. Uh, we're we're excited. My nephew got married in a, in a barn. It's the newest, latest trend in weddings, I guess. It is. It is. So we, we offer that, and we're actually renovating a caboose, a train caboose on the property. It's going to be an Airbnb as well. Cool. Yeah. Very hey, creative. You're going to be running against the incumbent, mm -hmm. Kent Leonhart, is how you pronounce the name? Yes. So, and this is a statewide office. Mm -hmm. So I, for a position that, quite honestly, for me is well under the radar, yeah. why do we want to fire him? Well, he is a good man. Let, let me say that. I, I, there are, it's a three-way race. Um, you have the incumbent and then the other Republican candidate. They're both good men. Uh, they both serve this country honorably. Uh, the incumbent has served this state, um, and I believe he's a good person. Uh, we just have a disagreement on policy and a disagreement on the direction of the Department of Agriculture. To wit. Um, hmm? In what way? In what way? Uh, he talks like an author, so, so don't, don't, yeah. don't just be too caught off guard. Uh, well, I think it is priorities. Uh, I think his priorities have been crowning the, the queens of fairs and festivals and, and pageants in the state, which is sort of a ceremonial duty of the, the commissioner of agriculture. And, and those fairs and festivals are important to rural communities, to small towns in the state. But that does not need to be the face of the Department of Agriculture, the Commissioner of Agriculture. It has to be developing those rural communities, the infrastructure, getting those economic development projects like distribution centers into the mountain state, uh, and then agritourism as well. You know, every single grocery store, Kroger, Walmart, Piggly Wiggly, I don't know if you have those up here, um, uh, every single grocery store in the state, almost all of their nas national distribution centers are based out of state down in the southern and western parts of the state, where do we get the food that's on the, the shelves at the grocery stores? It's from out of state. The, their hubs, their, their distribution centers are in Charlotte, Columbus, Pittsburgh. They're not here. And, and we have to incentivize those, those economic development projects and bring those jobs here. Does that mean the food is half stale by the time it gets to West Virginia? Well, I think uh, that depends on uh, on where you get it, but uh, uh, it, it basically means that that we're not buying food from West Virginia farmers. Joshua, what that means. talk to us about your your delegate experience. You served three terms. What mm -hmm. sorts of things did you work on? What sorts of yeah. laws did you sponsor or help get passed? Yeah, I was. Uh, I had two positions that were important in the legislature. I was chairman of economic development for two years. Uh, we passed the Opportunity Zone bill as well as the Historic Tax Credit bill. Uh, which from those two pieces of legislation the last four or five years we've seen tens of millions of dollars of economic development to every corner of West Virginia. I know there are several businesses in the Eastern Panhandle who are us using the historic tax credit and the Opportunity Zone tax credit uh, tax uh, benefit program and uh, that was a piece of legislation that I worked on. And then the other one when I was vice chairman of the Education Committee was the HOPE Scholarship. Uh, I led that effort on the House side. Uh, I know there were some great leaders on the Senate side from the Eastern Panhandle who, who led that effort. 
Uh, but I, I fought that fight. I defended it in committee. I defended it on the floor. Uh, and I have every intention of, of running on that, reforming it, and making it open to where students and families can spend that money on 4-H, uh, on FFA expenses. Uh, I really believe that career and technical education is going to be the future for uh, young people in this state. You are a young person. Uh, you've served three terms as a member of the House of Delegates. You're clearly the youngest person in this room by far. <laughs> by far. <laughs> Only marginally. <laughs> uh, uh, but you're remarkably mature for your age, and I'm sure that's not the first time uh, that you've uh, heard that. Uh, how did you, at the young, well, you, as I said, you got elected at the age of 18. You were asked to run when you were still in high school. How did you attain leadership positions at such a young age? Uh, I listened. I listened more than I spoke. Uh, I, Carol Miller, who's our, our congresswoman in the southern part of the state, she was the majority whip at the time. And she gave me the best piece of advice I've heard from any legislator out there. She said, Joshua, God has given us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Shut up and use your ears twice as much as your mouth. Uh, I found mentors. I had several older legislators who took me under their wing. And they taught me what to say, what not to say, what is best. Uh, and frankly, it took me the first year of my time in the legislature to just figure out the process. You, you cannot learn the entire government process from uh, a civics class. I hate to say that. You have to live it. And uh, it took me a while to, to understand that process. Uh, and it, it made me a better legislator by not uh, being the guy thinking I can move mountains overnight. Joshua Higginbotham is our guest. He's a candidate for Ag Commissioner in West Virginia. The future of West Virginia farming in Jefferson County right now, there is a battle between solar farms yeah. and what many people feel land was intended to be used for if it's a farm that is cattle or growing crops uh, as you look at the rest of the state uh, talk to me about that mix that's going on right now between use of land for solar farms and mm -hmm. what it was maybe intended for as some would view it sure so when I, when I was in the legislature I was also on the energy committee uh, we passed a bill that I was a co-sponsor on that legalized commercial solar projects uh, I, I fundamentally believe that if somebody wants to have uh, a solar project on their property, I, I'm a property rights guy. If they want to do that, that's the free market. What I don't want to see is people coming in and incentivizing uh, renewable energy with taxpayer dollars. That is what I don't want to do. And we made sure that when we passed that bill that we did not incentivize it with tax dollars. Um, I, I fundamentally believe that every person has the right to do whatever they want with their property. If they want to sell it to a company or, or lease it to a company, they have every right to do that. Uh, and I've had a couple conversations with a few city council members and some of the county commissioners here in the Eastern Panhandle about this exact topic. Uh, I know it's been a big point of contention with, uh, as I understand it, they rezone certain agriculture land for uh, commercial solar projects. Uh, I, I, th I think that the Department of Agriculture should sit down with all of these community leaders, have some kind of stakeholder meeting, and figure out what is the best course of action moving forward. Uh, because we don't want to interfere in private property rights, but we also don't want to incentivize solar projects with tax dollars. I, I get the distinction real quick here, Bill, before you go. Uh, in regards to farmland, you, you know, because your family has a farm, it can be difficult to make a living as a farmer in this country, uh, I think if you're selling your land because you can't make it as a farmer, you have every right to do what you want with your land anyway, period, end of story. But that's very understandable. If you're selling your land because you've been incentivized mm -hmm. to turn what used to be productive crop growing land into solar farms, at some point along the way, we can't keep losing farmland. Someone's got to make the food. Right. Right. Bill? Yeah. Going back to the solar, there's a uh, House Bill 5422 that would maintain the current net metering uh, uh, structure for the, for the mm -hmm. owners of solar panel. What is your position on that? Uh, so as I understand that bill, uh, essentially that would allow for uh, the companies to provide uh, credits to the accounts of those private consumers, right? Because uh, I, I have not read that yeah. um, that bill that's currently in the legislature. A couple of years ago, we had it. Uh, it's called power purchase agreements. So if somebody had solar panels on their property, 
uh, essentially during the daytime when they're not using as much energy themselves, they can sell it back to the, the power company uh, and then receive a, a credit. That, that is not tax dollars. That is an, an agreement between a private property owner mm -hmm. and an energy company. Um, and if they want to have that kind of agreement, that, that's fine. The problem is when you get a tax credit from the federal government to build those solar panels on someone's property. Uh, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, which was a totally poorly named piece of legislation, it, it, it did exactly that, whether it was electric vehicles, uh, solar panels, and, and I, I am absolutely opposed to, to taxpayer funding of renewable energy. But net metering, you you can see some merits in that, and that's basically. I think you described it correctly. If you have, mm -hmm. if you as a resident are generating more power than you're using, you can sell it to the uh, uh, to the power company, and generally you buy it back in the in the winter months. But, yeah, that that's technically the way it it, it works. Um, uh, it it just takes the the load off of the grid. Um, uh, but it's look, the problem with renewables is the energy storage. You you can't yeah. store the energy at the moment. That's why you have to have that base load, whether it be nuclear, coal, gas. Uh, you have to have that base base power load. Um, but yeah, I'm all for private property rights. Just don't do it with my tax dollars. Yeah. <clears throat> what are your thoughts about the state um, incentivizing, providing tax breaks and what have you, giving financial incentives for companies to move into West Virginia? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll make two comparisons. You have to look at Nucor. That's the big steel mm -hmm. producer down in the southern part of the state. That was my district. That was my area. What they did is they took our Opportunity Zone bill that we provided, uh, and they reformed it to allow certain manufacturers to come in and essentially did the exact same thing where they carved out an exemption in the Opportunity Zone bill for a large manufacturer like Nucor. So what they did is they were able to offset um, their capital gains taxes uh, in an opportunity zone for 10 years. And in exchange of not having to do that, they would get uh, those large taxpayer uh, tax credits, essentially. That was their money that they were getting. It's, it's their money and taxes that they were already going to be paying. Um, I, I think that one is different than, uh, uh, you know, let's say a, a solar tax subsidy in which you're getting money directly for a wind or solar project from the federal government. Uh, offsetting your taxes that you already owe is, is different because that's essentially a tax break. Uh, how, how would you make the distinction, though, between that and subsidies for coal mm -hmm. and, uh, and natural gas? Th there currently are no subsidies for coal and natural gas. There are tax breaks. Uh, particularly for existing uh, power plants. Let's take the Pleasance power plant uh, on the Ohio Valley. Uh, you know, a lot of coal companies have gotten property tax, or a lot of uh, power companies have gotten uh, property tax breaks from that. Uh, I, I do not believe that any energy company should get a bailout from the government uh, or direct taxpayer subsidies. Uh, but, but offsetting their taxes that they already owe or would owe in the coming years that is that I mean because that is their money at the end of the day just like any of us would owe taxes in the future Brad Noah had a question for you from our Facebook comment section and that and, uh, um, had to do with your family farm and whether you received your family received any tax breaks or credits for farming no we did not receive any tax breaks uh, for farming uh, no no tax credits for that uh, it's it's a business expense just like any business, so mm -hmm. when you're doing renovations to a property or upgrades, obviously you can you can take some kind of tax benefit from that. Um, but when it comes to, comes to the actual property itself, no. Uh, question also, I uh, can't remember the name of the person who asked it, but uh, would you find yourself as more of a big ag commissioner or a family farmer commissioner? Uh, so I, I think what that person's probably asking is where I stand on raw milk. Uh, <laughs> my that's be probably yeah. what uh, I, I view myself as the person that wants uh, quality food for every West Virginian. Uh, as long as every West Virginian has access to a grocery store in their community, I'm happy. Uh, despite what you might have heard, even in rural communities, they're not uh, traditional food deserts. 
we have an abundance of food in this state. The problem is we have a nutrition, a nutrition deficit in which people don't have access to quality foods. Look, for those who are watching the live stream, I'm a big guy. All right, yeah. I've never missed a meal in my beef, life. You got a beef farm. I got a beef farm. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. I'm, I'm grass fed, as they say. Uh, but at the end of the day, when people's only option is fast food and not an actual grocery store, in a lot of communities oh, in this state, we're killing ourselves. We are. We are. And I'm 27 years old, and I, I get it. I'm, I'm there too. Um, but that a lot of that is because we don't have access to actual grocery stores. You can't feed a family shopping at Dollar Tree or the dollar store all the time on processed foods. You need to have more farmers markets. You need mm -hmm. to have more Kroger's. Uh, you need to have actual uh, products. Overloading products on buy. processed food is like swallowing a time bomb, man. Sure. It's just not sure. good for you. We've, been, we've got more young people in their 20s and 30s getting colon cancer in this yeah. country. And our, our diet is a huge part of it. Yeah. You yeah. can't keep eating fast food. It's just not going to work long term. Exactly. Exactly. About a minute left, and that minute is yours, sir. Well, I, I just appreciate the Eastern Panhandle. I've been out here many times with, with my private sector job. Uh, I've, I've helped to co-teach a lot of concealed carry classes, hunter safety classes, and I uh, do a lot of church security team trainings here in the Panhandle. Uh, I, I love working with every single one of your representatives that you send down to Charleston. Uh, made a lot of great friends up here in the Panhandle. We are going to win this race. We took a poll last week. We are leading by double digits statewide. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a pretty large social media following and a lot of name ID in, in many parts of the state. Uh, and we're going to win the Eastern Panhandle. So if anybody wants to reach out, they can find me, Joshua Higginbotham. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or X, uh, LinkedIn. You're more than welcome to reach out. And uh, as always, it is so good to put a face to a name. Josh, thanks show. for dropping by. appreciate the effort that you made to stop on in. Of course. Joshua Higginbotham, candidate for Ag Commissioner here in the state of West Virginia.